So welcome back. This is going to be our very first screencast for Chapter 9. And in Chapter 9, we are going to be looking at the process called cell respiration. Now, when you see the word respiration, a lot of us think about breathing. We think about the ability of an organism to take in oxygen and to release CO2. Well, in this case, we're going to look at respiration in a little bit of a different way. We're going to look at respiration as being a process where we take a food particle, we take a molecule of food, and we break it down to release its energy. So we're going to look at cell respiration, and 9.1 is going to give us a simple overview of this process. Now the first thing that we need to do is we need to think about where do organisms actually get their energy. And if you think back to chapter 8, we had talked about two different groups of organisms. We had talked about autotrophs, and organisms that belong in this category were organisms like plants, and we had also talked about heterotrophs. And heterotrophs were organisms like us, right? Now, if you're an autotroph, then you have the ability to make your own food. So if you're a plant, you're specifically going to be making glucose molecules. And if you're a heterotroph, like I had said, like us, then you have to go out and obtain your food. Now, all of the energy that's found in food molecules is going to be found within the chemical bonds that are used to build that molecule. And the only way to access that energy is to break those bonds. Now, this food has to be broken down gradually. It's going to be releasing very small bits of energy at key steps within the process of cell respiration. So this is going to allow the energy stored in the chemical bonds of foods, like glucose, for example, to produce the compounds such as ATP that we had talked about back in Chapter 8. Now remember, this ATP is going to be used to power all of the life processes that occur within the cell. So this food is really important to us, of course, to produce the energy that we need to remain alive. So before we get too deep into the details of cell respiration, it's really important for us just to give you guys just a really quick overview of what cell respiration is. Now one thing that's important to understand is if an organism is going to carry out a complete process of cell respiration, and when I say complete, I mean it's going to actually go through all three different parts of cell respiration, then oxygen must be available for this to happen. And so again, as we had said before, organisms are going to obtain the energy from the food molecules that they take in or that they make from this process called cell respiration. So below is going to be a summary of the process. So what you're going to notice is we have an equation very similar to the one that we had looked at back in chapter 8 when we discussed photosynthesis. Like before, we have the reactants on the left hand side and we have the products on the right hand side. Now, if you notice for the reactants, as we had said, if you're carrying out cell respiration, most organisms will need to have a source of oxygen, so we have our O2. Then, of course, the C6H12O6 is going to represent the food molecule, and in this case, specifically glucose. Now, combining the O2, the oxygen, with our food molecule, as you carry out cell respiration, you're going to produce a waste product. So this is going to be our carbon dioxide that you see right here. So this would be the CO2 that we actually breathe out. Um, another product of cell respiration is going to be water. Then, of course, the product that we're most interested in is going to be the energy that's going to be extracted from that food molecule. So it says the energy must be released a little bit at a time and be controlled by the cell. If you released all of this energy at once from those food molecules, it would be released primarily as light and heat energy. And that energy cannot be used by the cell. Remember, the energy that we're looking at here, the energy that we need, is a chemical form of energy. So there are three stages of cell respiration that we need to focus on. And the first one is called glycolysis. The second is called Krebs. And the third is called the electron transport chain. Now, if you notice on the right-hand side, we have a picture that sort of depicts all three processes. The one towards the top is glycolysis. The one in the middle is the Krebs. And the one towards the bottom is the electron transport chain. So if we look at the one on top, what we're doing here is we're taking this glucose, which, remember, is going to be our food molecule, and we're breaking this six-carbon glucose down into two three-carbon molecules. And those two three-carbon molecules are called pyruvic acid. So these are called pyruvic acid. 
and those two molecules are going to be used to initiate or start the Krebs cycle. Now, during glycolysis, we're going to produce two ATP molecules that can be used by the cell. So in glycolysis, we produce two ATPs. Now, again, those pyruvic acids are going to be brought down to the Krebs cycle, and during the process here, we're going to produce an additional two ATPs for the cell to use. In addition to that, we're also going to be producing CO2. And remember, we breathe out CO2, and CO2 was a waste product for cell respiration. It was on the right-hand side of that equation. Now, the products that are produced during the Krebs cycle are also going to be used to power the electron transport chain towards the bottom. And we're going to get the bulk of our energy from this third process. And we're actually going to produce 32 ATPs here. So if you add all of these up from a complete process of cell respiration, we will produce 36 ATPs. Now you need to understand that as your demand for energy increases, so does your requirements for oxygen. So you're going to need more oxygen the more work that you need to do. Now, when you look at these three processes, what we do is we also categorize these processes as either being aerobic, which means basically requiring oxygen, or we consider them anaerobic. And if you put the prefix an, it basically means without. So in this case, you have a pathway that does not require oxygen. So you're going to notice that two out of the three do require O2. So the Krebs cycle is going to need oxygen, the electron transport chain is going to need oxygen, but the process called glycolysis will not need oxygen. So it's not necessary for this process to occur. You don't need to have O2 to take glucose and break that down into the two three carbon molecules called pyruvic acid. But you do need O2 for these other two processes to occur. Now back in chapter 7 we had looked at a specific organelle called a mitochondria. And what a lot of you had done when you had described the function of a mitochondria, you had said that it was considered the powerhouse of the cell. And when you think about powerhouse, you think about something that can be used to produce energy. And of course, in this case, we're talking specifically about a form of chemical energy called ATP. Now, this mitochondrion becomes really important in cell respiration because two out of the three parts of cell respiration occur within the mitochondrion. The Krebs cycle, as you see over here on the right, and the ETC or electron transport chain, again, as you see on the right, both of these occur within the mitochondrion. Now when you talk about glycolysis, which is that very first part of cell respiration, this is the one stage that does not occur within the mitochondrion. It actually occurs within the cytoplasm of the cell. So the first initial breakdown of that glucose into those two three carbon molecules called pyruvic acid, that occurs outside of the mitochondrion in the cytoplasm. Now if oxygen is not present, then there's going to be actually another process called fermentation that is going to be used to keep the glycolysis pathway going. Because if it's anaerobic, if no oxygen is present, then you cannot have Krebs, you cannot have electron transport taking place, and so we have another process called fermentation which will kind of take their place. But we're going to look at that process in section 9.3 of our text. So when you compare photosynthesis and cell respiration, you're going to find something very interesting when you compare these two processes. You're going to notice that cell respiration simply balances the process of photosynthesis. It says the energy in these two processes are going to flow in opposite directions. All right? And it's easiest to understand when you compare the two equations down here towards the bottom. Now this was the equation for cell respiration that we had looked at earlier on in the screencast. We had said in order to break down this glucose molecule, most organisms will need a source of O2. And when you break down this food molecule, then you're going to produce CO2, and then H2O is a waste product, and of course, we're most concerned with the energy that's being extracted from that food molecule. Now, if you compare this equation to photosynthesis, you're going to notice that simply the equation is flipped around. In photosynthesis, the plant's going to take advantage of the CO2 
it's going to take advantage of the H2 or the water, then of course we need a source of energy, which is going to be light energy, and it's going to produce its own food. And in this case, it's going to be glucose. Then of course it's going to produce another waste product called oxygen, and that's what we're going to use to be able to survive. Now on the right-hand side, you can see sort of a, a diagram that sort of depicts these two processes together. Again, we have a source of light energy at the top. The plant is going to use that light energy to produce its own food, so to produce the glucose and the oxygen. Now, of course, down here we're going to have this animal, which is going to take in, of course, the oxygen and also consume the food, so it's going to consume the glucose that's been produced by this plant. It's going to be able to use its mitochondrion. It's going to be able to use cell respiration to produce some chemical energy called ATP, and it's also going to produce a little bit of heat energy as a byproduct. Now, this extra water in the CO2 that's produced by this animal is again going to be taken up by the plant that you see up here towards the top and so the cycle is going to repeat itself. So both of the photosynthesis and the cell respiration um, processes are basically a balanced system. All right? it's, again, it's a reciprocal relationship between the autotrophs or the plants and the heterotrophs like ourselves. All right, so that's going to finish up our first screencast for Chapter 9. And as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.